All right, folks, um, we just get started with our soft start as people are, are wandering in. So today's going to be our second lecture on neural networks. And David and I thought it would be interesting to share. It's the last time we shared some examples at the beginning about neural networks that you might encounter in real life, you know, neural networks that help you with translations. I mean, the fact that you can you know, put up your phone to like a restaurant menu in many places around the world and get your, your menu translated, it's kind of very convenient and cool. Um, the you know, neural networks to help find and organize your images, all these sorts of things, like neural networks are kind of everywhere um, in, in real life. Um, but they're also uh, being used in a lot of scientific applications as well. Um, so we wanted to highlight a couple of those. Uh, and I just wanted to, mention, I'll, I'll start out with one that I think is pretty cool. This is work done by a, a former Harvard faculty member now at Princeton, Ryan Adams, um, and, and his lab, where they were trying to identify or make predictions about molecules and which molecules are going to have certain properties. For example, they were one, one project that they worked on was trying to create a blue LED. Yeah. <clears throat> and in this case, um, you know, we talked about convolutions last class, um, and that was on images, and it was kind of nicely organized, right? <laughs> like there was a grid, and you pass the convolution over an image. And the the cool, the really cool thing that they did for for this this project is that they came up with a way to apply convolutions on graphs. So imagine a, a, a graph of your, your molecule structure and every node looks around at its other nodes and forms a value. And that's like its convolutional value. Just like every pixel can look around at pixels around it and form its convolutional value. Um, so I think it's like a, a really great example of how there was kind of new machine learning done to create these graph convolutional networks that, other, that have popped up in other places as well, but had this really interesting science application. Um, yeah, and I, I think I remember in that case that so they were collaborating with Sharp and they were looking for molecules that would be blue emitting LEDs that would, um, you know, lead to new, new energy efficient technology. And I think there was also something very interesting where they were, they were, they were ranking the, they were using the machine learning to rank the molecules. And then they were trying to figure out which experiments they should be running in labs around the world because obviously the actual synthesis of the molecule and the experiment is very expensive and there was even some industrial espionage i think where they were worried that 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 if they ran all of the synthetic all of the real experiments in the same lab in one part of the world that oh, really? whoever was running the experiments story. may learn too much so they even figured out like how to kind of distribute the experiments so that the knowledge wasn't especially concentrated just a really oh, wow. nice real world industrial crossover um i wanted to mention another example there was a wonderful postdoctoral fellow in the harvard data science initiative called michelle tampaka who is now an assistant astronomer at the space telescope science institute at johns hopkins and she was using deep learning to understand the mass of galaxies in particular galaxy clusters, which are these huge dark matter dominated clusters. And astronomers are very interested in understanding how big they are and not only how big they are, but um, kind of how they cluster together and are looking for efficient and accurate ways to do that because they're just getting more and more data all the time with mm -hmm. new, uh, new telescope technology. And I thought, you know, two things that are interesting about this. One, again, they were using convolutional neural nets. And in this case, they were constructing an image from um, kind of a distribution, an image that would represent a distribution over the velocity of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And somehow from that complicated image object, they wanted to learn a regression model using convolutional neural networks to understand the image object itself. That's one thing that I thought was interesting. So again, kind of working hard to find the right image representation, so then you can feed into your machine learning method. In this case, they were using CNNs. Second thing that's really interesting is that the physicists and astronomers use a lot of very computationally intensive methods to simulate physical systems. Mm -hmm. And the way that they were generating their training data was through simulation. So they were running these 
38,000 plus um, N body particle simulations to generate the training data that then they would both train up the model and validate the performance of the model against the uh, kind of ground truth that was coming from, from the physics. That, and that reminds me that, that that pattern of like expensive simulation and can you um, somehow simplify that model or do it in a more concise way. I think that's a pattern you see across many of the sciences, uh, like Brendan Mead's work with uh, earthquakes, earthquakes and, yeah. and understanding earthquake patterns. So there's simulators of how, or like there's earth science simulators that tell you, here's the equations of how plates you know, right. move against each other and, and all of these things. Right. Uh, but they have lots of parameters and very sensitive. Um, and then uh, there's almost a reverse question. Like once you build uh, these much, gen often much smaller and, and accurate neural nets, um, what are they capturing, right? So then the scientists have something, they, they, there's almost like another science question of exploring the network itself to try to figure out what is the, what is, what are the physical laws that it has learned and how do they compare to? Right, and trying them. to, trying to actually bring that back into the scientific domain. Actually, Tim Kaxiris within CES is doing that kind of work where he's working with materials and trying to learn new physics laws based on what the machine learning is understanding. Yeah, so lots of lots of really cool directions, you know, for neural networks. You know, we've talked about the, the daily applications and some of the challenges there. Um, just wanted to point out some of these um, science applications as well. And these are all characterized by cases where you have lots of data, which is something that we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. Cool. So let me share my screen and we can get started with the main material. All right, so here we are. Um, we are on day two of neural networks. Um, so, so far, um, we have looked at supervised learning, the basics of the, the, the half of the cube that we've been looking at. Um, continuous and discrete wise, probabilistic, non-probabilistic methods. We, we covered the basics. And now we're going through basically three bonus parts. Uh, we, we worked on model selection. Um, today, we're going to be continuing with more expressive models, specifically neural networks. Um, and next time, we will start on more types of losses, um, in particular, max margin and SVM. In terms of just uh, uh, you know housekeeping, um, so the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is in section 4.4 of the CS 181 textbook. Um, we've made some updates um, to just clean up some of the notation and such. So um, if you have if you have like a PDF on your computer, uh, this might be a good time to repull again. We have an ed post about this as well. Um, also, you know it, CS 181 is a very broad course. As you've noticed, you know we we cover you know the a, a broad area of supervised methods, a broad area of unsupervised methods. We only have these two lectures on neural networks because there's a lot of machine learning that's not neural networks. Um, but if you are curious and you want to learn more about um, neural networks, then uh, the Beyond CS one eighty one sections um, that are hosted by Bill on Wednesdays. Um, are going to go into this stuff in a lot more detail. So if you're curious, um, definitely please check those out. Um, and, and that's not required material. It won't be on your homework. So it won't be on midterms or anything. This is just bonus. If you're curious about this stuff, we realize that many people are, uh, are very fascinated by um, you know, modern, modern deep learning and the course has you know, relatively small amount of time devoted to it. The other thing that I'm just going to note um, is that homework three is out. Um, we really encourage you to try to start early um, if you can. Um, just give yourself enough time. I think I was thinking back to my undergrad. Actually, there's an art of appropriate procrastination. Right? <laughs> you start too early. You spend all your life doing two sets. You start too late, um, and you don't get it done. Right? So um, I, I understand this is a reinforcement learning. I'm a reinforcement learning person. This is a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, but just from what we're seeing in the submissions. Um, we encourage folks to start early, give yourself enough time, reach out when you need help. You know, staff really wants to be helpful, um, but it's very hard for us to be helpful at the last minute. Um, but if you start early, then um, we are working hard to provide opportunities and we're also very open to feedback um, in terms of ways that we can better support you all. 
So please, please let us know if you have um, if you have suggestions. All right. So last time, what we did is we talked about neural network architectures. So uh, basically, um, we were we were not focused on how to do the optimization, but we said that let's suppose that there's some some inputs x1 and now these little um, uh, subscripts are referring to dimensions through xd and in their simplest model these went into a single hidden layer um, that we called phi and each one of these nodes connected into each one of these phi nodes so the phi1 down to phi capital j and we're going to uh, use the matrix W1 to refer to this particular layer. Um, so actually, let me write out a full equation here. So phi vector was equal to sigmoid W1 matrix times x the vector plus w, little w1 naught. So this is our bias term. These are our weights. And this was a compressed way of writing down how to produce the entire phi matrix, uh, sorry, phi vector um, with, uh, with this vector matrix multiplication and then a pointwise application of the sigmoid. I'm gonna be writing down sigmoid or using sigmoid today, um, but you could fill in other activations, other nonlinearities as we talked about last time. And then these things, combined together to produce our output F from the network. And for that particular combination, we just have F is equal to um, some, some final, actually, it's, I think I use a subscript. Um, so I could put the transpose on phi plus W not final. We're going to have to work with subscripts and superscripts today. I'm trying, going to try to be very clear about what I'm referring to. But f is equal to a linear combination of these phi's. And then something else could happen. For example, if we were doing class, if we we're doing regression, this would be it. We would be done. If we were doing classification, we might have to pass this whole thing through one more sigmoid. So this was our, our basic one layer network. And now the obvious question is, how do we optimize? So this time, we're going to talk about how do we optimize? Okay. And the short answer is going to be a lot of chain rule. Um, so today, um, we're just going to work through in detail how we're going to use the chain rule to take gradients to optimize this thing. Bulk of the lecture is going to be associated with that process. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about why this works, like some intuition about why we're able to do this. This is like a horribly convex, a non-convex, sorry, function. Why are we able to just kind of take gradients and, and have this thing do anything reasonable at all? Right, so we're going to start out with the the nitty gritty, the push ups, right, um, and then at the end we'll get to a little bit of the understanding of the why. I'll say though that the why is still a, a work in progress, right? The, there's a lot of active research going on in terms of why you know optimization in neural networks works and why neural networks work so well. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, uh, yeah, let's. Uh, oh, one more quick note. Um, so in your homework. There's, there's two parts um, or two ways you're going to interact with this optimization. One is you're going to be basically replicating the process that I'm going through today with you um, about like how do you actually take all of these derivatives? Because I think it is important to do at least once in your life, you know, <laughs> to just understand, you know, how um, all of these chain rules get passed around. Um, but when it comes to implementation, thank goodness you don't have to do it anymore. Um, because there are automatic differentiation tools out there that basically are going to do all of this chain rule stuff for you. Um, and so the other part of your homework, you're going to be using PyTorch 
to implement an optimization for neural network architecture. And, and there, you know, you're not going to have to actually implement any of these, you know, uh, annoying matrix optimizations. So um, I just want to emphasize that we don't, you don't have to do it, but it's good, you know, the, the point of 181 is to, to tell you kind of what's happening under the hood. So we're going to go through under the hood, um, you know, what are these tools doing um, and, and what's the process. All right, so how do we do the optimization? So let's start um, our optimization with the last layer, layer last output part. So over here, we had outputted an S and let me just draw there's a few pieces that kind of add on to here. So there's a Y and an F, and the Y and the F are producing your loss together somehow, right? This is the real uh, true value, and, and this is your prediction or something that's going to turn into your prediction. You're going to put them together to get your loss, right? So let's look at that, just that last part. So if we're doing regression, so that's the, the case where the Ys are, are continuous then we might be using a squared loss, right? So we could be saying that L, I'm gonna use a, just a big capital W to mean like all the weights in the network. And then as needed, I'll, I'll specify this W1 or W01, et cetera, et cetera, right? So for now it's just loss due to overall, the, the, the parameters um, is equal to um, one half sum over N, yn minus fn squared. So this would be our squared loss um, note. We could choose something else here. But let's say, suppose that we're going with the, the squared loss. Well, um, this, this loss, the, the impact uh, that pr the parameters W have it, it, on the loss is implicit. It comes through this Fn over here. So if we want to know the derivative of this loss with respect to the parameters, well, the very first thing that we have to do in terms of chain rule is we have to think, okay, what is the loss um, with respect to F? And then what is the, the change in um, the, and, and all, by the way, I, I may be a little bit sloppy with gradients and, and like the, the del um, derivative notation. Um, if anything's unclear, um, let me know. Um, but here, the gradient um, with respect to W of Fn, right? So this is our, our initial chain rule gives us the following. Um, and this term over here in this particular case um, is just equal to negative of y n um, minus f n, right? It's a pretty simple function that we have. And what I wanna note is that this is the only place where the final loss choice appears. So if I had changed this loss to be something else, um, like the, the, a, a different norm, right? Like instead of a squared norm, I, I want it to be like a three norm or something else. Um, I, or if I wanted to have like a probabilistic loss with like a T noise or Laplace noise, whatever, right? I could do all kinds of things here um, in, in, in this particular phase. And the only place they're gonna have an effect is through like the effect of Fn on the loss because every part of the parameters, the way the parameters affect the final loss is mediated through this Fn over here, right? Um, and the same goes for, for classification. Same idea. For example, um, let's say that we are using a, a, a logistic 
regression approach, then the probability um, that y equals one given x is gonna be equal by to one over one plus x negative fn. Um, and actually David and I were chatting a little bit about this before class. So um, I, I've mentioned how like transposes and negative signs are always like the bane of everything that I do. And the way I survive this is, all, is by trying to check as I go. So this is saying that if Fn is really large, then the x of a uh, negative of a very large number is zero. Um, and so I have one, right? So this is kind of matches, okay, if Fn is big, then y is probably one, right? So, it, it, so the negative sign is going in the right direction. Um, and I, I find these sort of things are really helpful because if I just try to memorize, I, I'm, I'm gonna memorize it wrong, right? <laughs> or am I gonna remember wrong? So here is our, this is just the opposite, right? Um, so here, here is our, our setup. And then what if our, then our loss is just gonna be our log loss. Y n um, log, um, One plus x negative f n plus one minus y n log one plus x n. And the way I got this, just as a note, we got this by taking the negative log of p of y given x, um, which is equal to a negative log product over n p. I'm going to call this just so I can fit it onto the, the rest of this line p1, which is this, this thing right here. Let's call this p1, p0, p1 to the y n and p0 to the 1 minus y n. So I, I had this expression, I took the logs, um, there were some negatives that canceled because there's a negative, we're, we're trying to minimize the negative of the, the log probability. We wanna maximize the probability, minimize the negative of that. And that's where um, the, the negative from the log and the negative from here cancel each other out. But anyway, so we got this expression. Um, and just as before, I can put another note. Um, this could, have been hinge, et cetera. Any other choice would have been fine here. And then we can try to take some derivatives. So what is the derivative of this loss with respect to the parameters? Um, well, the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters is gonna be equal to the derivative of the loss with respect to um, the, the function uh, or the output f. Um, and the derivative, and how do the parameter, how do the parameters affect this this f over here, right? Um, so if I'm, it, oh, you know what? Oh, did I do this above here? Too. Um. Yes. So one thing that I am going to be doing for all of lecture is that I'm going to be focusing on the loss for one particular element. So in general, we're going to have to do some summations over the, oh, so here I need to do a summation over n derivative of the loss with respect to w is going to be equal to the sum over um, for all the different losses because we have n of these and they're all distinct, right? Um, and then over here, I need to put in this summation also. But going forward, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to consider the loss for one particular data point. But for now, I'll put in that summation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we can do this. Um, and taking this derivative, um, again, comes out of your basic calculus. Um, and we will get something that looks like y n um, x negative f n one plus x negative fn um, times negative one. Let me just write it all out. Um, 
All right. Um, and so the, the point is that we can get this expression, right? And, and this expression maybe looks a little bit familiar from when we talked about logistic regression several lectures ago, but it's a, it's a thing we can write down, right? Um, it's a thing that we can calculate in both cases, um, but there's an important piece in both of these losses, right? So um, we can calculate this, right? It has an analytic form. Analytic form. Um, except it depends on Fn, right? Um, so sitting over here in the derivatives are some Fn's. And then if I go up to the regression case as well, um, here was an Fn that was sitting there. So important question is where does the Fn come from, right? Um, how do I know what Fn to plug in when I'm trying to calculate you know, this formula over here I need to calculate, I'm trying to calculate the derivative of the loss, uh, gradient of the loss with respect to all the parameters. And now I suddenly need to plug in some Fn along the way. Um, so the main idea here is that um, <clears throat> what we're gonna do is you know, step one. So we're gonna give in current W, we're gonna compute Fn. And then step two, we're gonna use those Fn's to compute um, derivatives. Okay. Um, and this works because we, we need the Fn's for where we're sitting right now, right? We have some W's um, that tells us where we're sitting, what our Fn's are, and those are the Fn's that we need when we take the take the derivatives, right? I'm just emphasizing that there is this forward computation step that needs to happen um, when, you're, when you're doing this whole process. All right, so great. Um, we, we, we computed the derivative um, with respect to, um, in this picture, this part over here, right? So the part that we just did was a derivative for this part. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go one step backwards and say, hey, let's try to uh, peel back and optimize these parameters over here. Right, so this was kind of step one. Now we're gonna go to step two. Let me just um, label this also as a one. And down here as two. So now we want to um, continue down on our way. Um, I'm just going to make a quick, a uh, quick detour um, on vector matrix chain rule um, as we, uh, because we're going to need it. So suppose um, we have, now this is just completely general, we're, we're, this is our detour emphasize this is a little detour, um, that we have y is equal to f of some variable u, u is equal to um, g of some variable v, v is equal to h of some variable x. Um, and we're interested in um, dy, d, uh, the change in y um, that comes from the change in x. Well, if these are all scalars, this is like super straightforward from like your calculus experience. How does Y change when U changes? How does U change when V changes? How does V change when X changes, right? That's your basic chain rule um, from calculus. So this is your basic chain rule. Um, so now suppose that um, some of these things are, are vectors because of what we're going to turn this into is that these intermediate things like these U's and V's are like the intermediate layers in the network, right? So that's where we're, we're heading towards, but we're just doing this in the abstract very briefly um, as review, just, just so we have it. So suppose now, um, if, if all scalars, let me just write that down explicitly, if all scalars. So now suppose um, that X is a vector. 
So what is this uh, new expression going to look like? Well, the gradient uh, with respect to x of y is going to look like this. where these are still scalars, right? How does y change when u changes? Um, how does u change when v changes? Um, but this thing over here is gonna be a vector of size d because x is of size d. And what that's telling us is that for every dimension of x, when you change a little dimension of x, how does it change our scalar v? Right, so it's going to be a vector of size d. So now suppose let's let's kind of skip right into um, the cases where u, v, and x are vectors. Um, by by the way, like here in terms of dimensionality, right? We would expect that if x is a vector um, again of size d, then the gradient with respect to y has to be like a d-dimensional thing, right? Because for every change in x, you need to think about what will the change in y be. So now if u, v, and x are vectors, the final thing still should be something of size d, right? Because we are still interested in the, the gradient um, with respect to x of y. So let's just kind of make sure that that happens as we, you know, that's something we just keep in mind conceptually as we go through this whole process. So this is going to be equal to um, <clears throat> how does uh, y change when u changes? So for every dimension of u, um, how does y change? So this is going to be a vector of size um, one by, let's say that let's give these guys dimensions. So let's give this side dimension J, let's give this one J prime, um, J and D. So these are the sizes of each of these. So if these are the sizes, this is gonna be a vector of size one by J prime, because that's the size of U, right? For every dimension of U, how does, um, how does Y change? Um, and then we're gonna have the Jacobian, a matrix of derivatives, of pairwise derivatives, of how does, um, for every change in V, how does, how do we get changes in U, right? So if dimension one of U changes, how does dimension three of U change? That's a matrix that contains every pair of those pieces. So this is gonna be a matrix, it's gonna be J prime by J. And then finally, we're gonna have one more matrix, which is how does um, every element of V change when every element of X changes? And this is going to be a matrix that is J by D. Okay. Um, and if you don't know which way the matrices should be set up, you just think about like, well, what is this doing? This is propagating how changes in X change every part of V and how changes in various parts of V accumulate to changes in U and how those go to Y. So when you multiply this thing out, it's gonna be important that this whole thing, you know, the, the J primes are gonna multiply by each other, the Js are gonna multiply by each other, and the final thing that you get is gonna be one by J, right? That's the thing that we wanted. So this is, again, very briefly, um, we just went through um, chain rule for, for vectors. Now let's go back to our actual case um, that we're, we're interested in. <clears throat> So recall um, that Fn, it's, it's higher up on the, this is one thing, you know, like I wish I had blackboards, right? So you could have the other equations still up, but we don't. So I'm going to just rewrite um, our, our final expression that was up there before, um, Fn plus W not final. So this is where, where we're at. We're trying to get the derivative um, uh, of I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to write the derivative of the loss for the nth element, so I don't have to carry around those sums anymore um, with respect to this um, vector of, um, of weights in that final layer. 
So this is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to ln, uh, sorry, uh, of ln with respect to fn. We already did this. And we're going to multiply it by um, the gradient of how does fn change when wf changes. And in this particular case, um, uh, this is just the n, right? Um, and as before, so note, as before, we need to do a forward pass to compute the n. So let me write down actually what this one looks like. So in, in the case of regression with least squares, sorry, with least squares, um, loss. This comes out to negative yn minus fn, right? So these two numbers over here need to be, or, or just this part, sorry. These two numbers over here um, need to be computed during the forward pass. So given the parameters we go through and we, uh, as we compute through the network, we get a certain value for phi n, we get a certain value for fn. So those numbers are, these are numbers that are available to us. Um, and then we plug them in when we're taking this derivative or, and notice, you know, just in terms of kind of the units make sense here. Um, this thing is a scalar. And this over here is a vector, phi is a vector of size wf, right? And so that is our, our final gradient for wf. And we could do a similar thing for w naught f, but I'm not going to because I want to continue on for the rest of the network. So this is probably a good time. I've, I've been going a little long. Um, uh, this is probably a good time to take like a two minute break um, and people can hop in with questions and then we'll finish this and then we'll talk about the general case as soon as we, um, we get back from a two minute break. Questions? Yep, David. Uh, could you clarify again why uh, the second partial, um, so like derivative of f of fn of with respect to final weights, that is why that is equal to phi of n? Yep, it's coming exactly from this equation over here. So fn is being defined um, as the the final output. Actually, oh, so. Okay, I see. Oh, okay, got it. Okay, yeah. yeah. So in the in the in the network, that's just how we defined it. So then we're just taking, this is just a linear form. Yeah, I was just slightly confused because I was looking at like the previous um, equations, like where, where phi was equal to sigma of the weights. Uh, like so we're going to yeah. do that next. So like this right. is one set of weights, but there's another set of weights that we're yeah. going to And it's just like for the final layer, like there's specifically no sig sigmoid that you're using. So that's, that's right. why you yeah. can do that. I'm okay. taking other regression. Cool. Mm -hmm. Questions? Nolly, there's a question in chat from Lucy about a recap of the superscripts and subscripts and underlines, maybe just a uh, quick yeah. okay. notational so, recap. Right. So what, what do I mean here? I'm going to try very hard to say in words what I mean as I go, because um, I realize there's, there's some overloaded notation. So um, uh, the underlines are for vectors. Um, I think I, I'm trying to remember to underline the vectors, but I don't always. So people can catch me or, and also just try to um, think to yourself, like, you know, what is this sort of thing? What is this quantity supposed to be? Um, the little f here is referring to like the final layer, um, the, the final output. And this not is referring to the bias term. So the knots are always bias terms. The 
the F refers to the last one. We're going to change up the, this to when we go to multiple layers, but in this particular case, the F is the last, the last stage after kind of each of these um, potentially multiple fees have been created. Um, and then this little N is the data point. So N will always refer to the data point. And so here I'm only considering the loss with respect to one data point. And I could sum over the losses for every data point to get the loss over the data set. I think that's most of our subscripts at the moment. Um, I, if we need them or in a few moments, <laughs> all right, we will get some dimensions as well. Um, and then I'll try to be really clear whether a subscript is referring to a, um, the, the data point or a dimension um, as we go through this. Um, I realize that this is the, the notation here can kind of get messy, especially when we're putting in these transposes. Um, like I, I, I guess I could put the F up here and then I would have like a F and a T next to each other. Yeah, if things are unclear, please do, please do ask. All right, so let's do the, the last uh, chain rule, at least for this, you know, one layer network. Um, so now, okay, finally, so this will be, we could, we could describe this as step three. We go back way up to the top. You know, we tried taking, we got derivatives, or we know how to take derivatives now with respect to these parameters. And the last part is this, over here, right? We need to take derivatives with these parameters. It's W1, and so now the superscript is referring to the layer. So it's one, in this case, there's only one layer, um, but layer one, um, and it's an it's bias term. So we're gonna be focusing on this term over here in terms of the, the gradients. So now finally, um, we want gradients with respect to this W1 parameter, this, this matrix. Um, and the bias term I'm not including because it's kind of straightforward. It follows the same sort of pattern. Um, and for that, uh, we need to recall that phi n um, is equal to the sigmoid of W1 phi n vector is equal to uh, the sigmoid of W1 matrix x vector plus vector of bias terms. So the not indicates that it's a bias term and the one indicates for the first layer. Um, so now we want the, how does the, the loss change um, for a particular data point um, when we change this, um, this W1. So, well, it's, it's just more chain rule, really, um, <laughs> right? So here is D, uh, or the change in the, oops, change in the loss when you change F. Um, how does um, F change uh, when you change phi? Um, phi N. And then we're gonna need to know how does now we're this now this now now we're in the the, the land of Jacobians. Um, how do these um, matrix parameters, uh, all of these parameters up here, um, affect the phi n? Right. So this is what we got to do. Um, this one right here we had before. This guy is a scalar, um, and we just noted for regression it's just you know negative y n minus f n. Um, this one over here, we can compute fairly easily if we go up here. So here I was trying to take the, understand the loss, how the loss changes with respect to um, these final weight parameters. But if I instead focus on uh, how does, uh, how does the loss or how does Fn change when Fn changes, this is still linear form. Now I'm just taking the derivative in the other direction. So the, the gradient of Fn with, sorry, of Fn with respect to Fn is going to be just W final over here. Um, that's fairly straightforward. Um, I'll deal with my transposes at the very end because I know what's gonna have to match up. Or actually, let me, uh, yeah, I'll just deal with my, my transposes and such at the very end. We know that the, the dimensions of this, it's multiplying a scalar. So it's gonna have to have like a one on this side and a 
J on this side, right? Um, and then we have this over here. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to draw this somewhat graphically just in pictures. And what I, so for every, um, so phi uh, has J dimension, right? That's what we said at the beginning. And I'm going to flatten W1. So W1 has dimensions that are J by D, right? Because it's multiplying this D dimensional vector X and it's turning it into this J dimensional vector phi. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten it and basically flatten it into segments that are sets of D dimensions for J times. So into J sets of D dimensions. And the reason why I'm going to do that is that now this Jacobian is going to have a very sparse form. So for phi one, um, there's only going to, so phi one only depends on the part of this matrix that is corresponding to J is equal to one. So you're going to have terms here, you're going to have terms here, you're going to have terms here all the way down. And each one of these terms is going to be the derivative um, with respect to um, a particular pair. Let me let me expand it one 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 le one level more. But then, and then again, I don't want to just walk through all of this in more detail because I want to get to the to the general case. Make sure we have time. Um, so I can write down this phi n as sigmoid of sum over dimensions. W1, and now D is dimensions, right? So uh, we're going to have W, uh, D, J, D, um, X dimension D, let's see, D, N, J. Let me do this. And so this is the nth B, nth X. So this is our data set. This is the dimension. So this is which data element, this is a dimension, right? So there's two different types of indices here, um, plus the, the relevant bias term over here, right? So now that I've written this out, hopefully it's not too hard to imagine how you could use your basic calculus to do the chain rule to figure out what is the derivative um, of B and J with respect to W1, J, D, and those are going to be the elements of this matrix over here. So now we have a way of computing final set of well, a derivative of the final set of parameters, and, and we can do gradient descent, right? So the, the point of this exercise was to show that we had analytic forms for everything, and we can just plug in, right? It's kind of messy, not but not super messy, but kind of messy, and we can just plug in. Um, any any questions here before I go on to the more general case? of multiple layers of how we do this. There's a lot of bookkeeping. Maybe, maybe, maybe just remind people what the little j index is. Right. So um so phi is j dimensional, remember. So we had drawn it up here as maybe I should put a little j over here. So x's go from x1 to x in terms of the vector with little d representing just an element somewhere in the middle. And phi's go from phi1 to dimension capital J with little j meaning some element um, in the middle. OK, so now what about multiple layers? So in some senses, this is pretty straightforward. It's just more chain rule, <laughs> right? Um, but there is kind of a nice way to do um, the calculation. So that, that we're still going to have the same steps. So step one is still going to be the forward pass, which is compute um, all the stages of your network. So now if you have x, going into uh, uh, producing a phi 
one, where at one is going to represent the fee for the first layer produced by some W1. And then some W2 is going to go produce fee two. I'm going to use little l, a superscript l, to mean some layer in the middle. And then finally, we're going to get to some final layer through some WL, and then we're going to get to our F, right? So that's kind of the structure that we have. So the forward pass is to basically do follow these arrows and do this computation. And then step two is going to be the backward pass, which is the chain rule. And I find it most intuitive to, to visualize this um, with this computation structure or computation graphs. I'm going to draw the picture um, and then we can talk about it a little bit. So when we're at some layer L, um, phi of L is a function of phi L minus one, the values of the features of the previous layer, and it is a function of the weights at this layer. And for now, I am not writing down any of the bias terms because they can be just dealt with analogously um, at, at every step of the way. So here we go. And when we're doing the forward computation, what we end up doing is that we, we, we have a phi L minus one that we've been calculating, you know, X turns into phi one, turns into phi two, yada, yada. So there's a, a phi L minus one that we get. And we need to pass phi L for the next computation, right? To be able to compute phi L plus one, phi L plus two, et cetera. When we're taking derivatives, we're going in the opposite direction. So here we're going to get the gradient, the gradient of the loss um, with respect to phi L. So, um, Right. Um, so if phi L changes, um, how will the loss change? Um, it can be the full loss or a LN. And then we have some computations to make. So we can compute um, the grade. So if we want the gradient of the loss with respect to um, this WL over here, um, then we need to take um, this phi L and we need to multiply it by this Jacobian of how does WL um, produce our phi L, right? So given this, assume someone has already given us this, we already showed how to do it for one last layer in the previous case. Um, so someone has given you this, um, you're able to compute um, the loss with respect to this set of parameters for this layer um, by just doing some chain rule, right? Um, and then we need to continue to pass things back. So we need to take the, the gradient, we need to pass back the gradient of phi um, L minus one of L it back in this direction. And we can again use the gradient, uh, sorry, the chain rule for this because we have, um, how does the loss change um, with respect to phi L? And then we have a Jacobian of how um, phi how, how phi L changes based on phi L minus one. Right. So this is our basic process, right? Going forward, um, I think it's pretty intuitive. Um, we just uh, have our phi L's and they, phi L minus ones and they produce our phi L's. Going backwards, it's, it's very similar, um, but it, there's a few more steps, right? Because you have a gradient that's coming in. Um, we, we get, the, um, the gradient for our layer. So that's one job that we have to do. Um, and then we compute the gradient to pass back. And that's how we can do this whole process relatively efficiently. And it's all different matrix multiplications. So any questions there? This is a pretty key picture or graph. Um, that we've been building up to, right? Like we, we've seen how we do this in a very simple setting of one hidden layer. And now we're talking about chain rule for multiple layers. Okay, so now let's go into a couple of notes. 
right? Enough, <laughs> enough notation for the day. Um, we're, we're, we're through. Um, let, let's get to some notes and ideas. So uh, the first note that I want to make is that the above is called um, reverse mode um, differentiation because we started at um, Fn or Y. Let me not leave that as a slash. Um, started at Fn and we went backwards. Um, and this is good uh, for um, gradients with respect to the parameters uh, because we can use this graph, right? We can use this form to, to make the reuse computations that when we need to take the derivative at layer L minus one, we don't take the chain rule all over again backwards. We have it, it the value is sticking around, right? So this, this value over here is a product of many uh, uh, many matrices, many chain rules. We don't need to recompute that over here, right? We just use the values that we already have. Um, so this is great because we can reuse things out along the way for um, each set of these. Um, you know, we need derivatives with W L little L W little L minus one little W L plus one. We're reusing a lot of computation. Um, reuses computation. That's nice. Um, check mark. Uh, there is another way you could imagine taking derivatives. So another approach is forward mode. And mostly I just want to introduce you to the terminology. Um, so if you see it somewhere, you know what people are talking about. And here we go from a, a change in X forward to a change in, in F. And this is, um, this is useful if you're uh, so it's still still chain rules, you know, still chain rules. We're not going to work it out, but it's more efficient if you only care. Like you might care, you know, for this image. If I change this pixel, you know, was this a, a wonky pixel that's like influencing the behavior of the, the output of the image? Um, so if I want to ask that really specific question, maybe I don't need the derivatives with respect to all of the parameters. I only need the derivatives with respect to the parameters that are touching that particular pixel um, and going forward. Um, so this can be better, still chain rules, um, can be useful for a local a gradient uh, check question that you might have that doesn't need like all the gradients with respect to like all the parameters, for example. Okay. All right, so that's the basic process. So the next uh, or the last thing that I want to do is I want to spend just a couple moments um, and, and we're a little short on time. So I, uh, I'm going to try to be brief because the, the concept check for today is a, is a, is a good one, is an important one. Um, is like, why does this all work? And as I mentioned at the beginning of class, the part we don't know, right? Like this is there's theory that is still still being worked out, but there are things that are um, there, there's a confluence of things that definitely are are relevant. Um, so first, let's stop. Not worry about the optimization, but let's just think about a, a, just a, other factors, right? So one important factor is just computation. Um, you know the fact that we have GPUs. Um, that can do all of these matrix multiplications super efficiently. It, you know, there's no denying that that's a game changer um, in terms of being able to train large networks. Another thing that is a, a huge game changer is just data. Um, so, so large data sets. And um, at the beginning, David was talking about this example of galaxies and the fact that we have these star surveys, um, which are collecting data much faster than people can go around and label them or do computations with them. Um, the fact that we have very large data sets compared to like the 90s absolutely make a huge difference because it turns out that neural networks are very good interpolators. So if you have lots of data in your training set, 
then you end up doing well because you can kind of map to near points or interpolate between near points really well um, with a neural network. So large data sets. So that's another thing in terms of like why did overall, like why does this enterprise work? And then when it comes to optimization, one key note is that um, over parameterization makes the optimization um, easier. And there's a way in which this is kind of intuitive perhaps. So if you have a function, if you have a line to fit um, and you, you're trying to fit that line, you're trying to create a line and you have your two parameters, um, there's only one setting of that, those parameters that are going to be a good fit for that particular line, right? Um, and you have to find them. And when you get to complicated non-convex models, um, it, if you're kind of over here and you're trying to find a, a, you know, a set of parameters over here and, and, and your, your lost landscape kind of takes a dip in between, you have lots of local optima, um, you're just not going to be able to get there. Right. Um, and what the overparameterization does um, is helps you move around more easily because now there, there's give the one way to think about it again, kind of intuitively, is that there's more give in the system. Um, so there's ways that you can move around that don't make your loss totally crash. And you so you're able to have some more flexibility in moving around. Um, and there's also work that shows that. Um, especially when you have really large networks, you don't actually have to move that much. Um, so there's this, this neural tangent kernel work that talks about you know, infinitely wide networks or as networks get really big um, that, that formalizes some of this. But the idea again is that when you have networks that are, are really big, um, it kind of makes sense, right? The, it, wherever you start the parameters, doesn't take much shifting of those parameters to find something that fits the data perfectly, um, that you get zero loss on your training data. So given that, and, and by the way, I should say that I'm not an expert in anything remotely related to neural network optimization, um, but there are folks at Harvard working on this. Um, so, uh, so Boaz's lab um, here at Harvard has been doing some interesting work on trying to understand the theory of like neural networks and neural network optimization. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in more of this, check out their work, check out other work. Um, you know, this is a very hot area of research right now. So what we're going to do um, in terms of hot areas and hot topics, um, I, actually, let me pause. Any, any questions before I go into the, um, to the concept check? With... No, OK. So in terms of hot topics, so the, the hot topic that we're going to look at in the concept check is this question of like, why don't the neural networks overfit, right? Or what does it mean when we say like, okay, we're training this large network and we train them till we get error zero. They're kind of fitting the data perfectly. And yet somehow that, that turns out okay. Like, isn't that kind of weird? Um, and there's this phenomenon that is known as double descent. So I'm going to switch um, the screen that I'm sharing. Take a look at this, and I will also share the link to the concept check right here. Right. All right, so we have the, the concept check. So this phenomenon that is known as double descent. So the idea here is that when we did model selection, um, it, we had this notion of the bias variance trade-off. And when we looked at error, um, error decreased um, uh, as the model got more complicated uh, because we were having less bias. And then the error increased as we were getting more variance. And in fact, you did a homework problem where you looked at this phenomenon, right? And you kind of, you saw this U-shape that happened. Now, recent literature, um, including work from Boaz's lab has demonstrated, um, has seen this phenomenon where, hey, the curve goes down, the curve goes up, and then here's the double descent. It goes back down again. Isn't that weird, right? Um, and so what you're going to be doing in this concept check for the next five minutes or so, and then we'll regroup, um, is that we're going to try to think about like, why, why does that happen? Why might that be happening? And the key point, the really key point that I want to make um, 
is that this double descent curve is based on us using a gradient based optimization, um, uh, you know, starting the weights relatively small, right? That's going to be a key point. So I just want to emphasize that now, let you all think about what that might imply as you do the concept check. I just emphasize that that point, it, it, that, that detail is not just a random detail that we put in. That detail is kind of key to the question. Okay. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to- I have to... the rooms all set up. If you're oh, perfect. To... Okay. So we're, we're going to go out into breakout rooms for about five minutes and then we'll, we'll regroup. Should be going. All right, um, so we have a, a number of responses um, that folks are coming in with. Um, we can go ahead and, and share the screen as they're coming in. Um, so thank you again for filling them out. Um, this helps us as well kind of know what people are thinking. Um, so the first question was, um, you know, as the model size increases, right, that was the, the axis down here. Um, can the bias increase? And the correct answer is no, because the model is getting more and more expressive, right? So there's so if, a, if model A can capture the data and model B has more parameters, then model A kind of lives inside model B, right? Um, like there's a network, there's a sub-network if we make the, the layers wider, for example, um, uh, that, that, you know, that, that's inside. So the idea is that the bias is always going to be decreasing. So there, this, this part, there's going to be a bias that's decreasing. So must be the variance that is perhaps creating this up and then down. And we knew the variance was creating up, right? And the question is kind of what's happening on the way down. So we go to the responses um, for, for the second question, which is let's say that there's some noise. Um, what's the relationship when um, we have uh, parameters, uh, much less than data, parameters about equal to data and parameters um, much greater than data. And so if we don't have enough parameters, right, um, we're not gonna fit the data perfectly. It's just impossible, right? There's noise and there's no way to, to draw a line and kind of thread through all the points. Um, however, if we have parameters that are uh, about equal to the amount of data, this is the place where we can find that one crazy fit, right? The crazy fit that goes through all the points and there's gonna be probably exactly one, right? And so this relates to this question of variance, right? Because every time we draw a data set, we're going to get what? A new set of noise. So every time we get a new data set, the, the noises on the X's that we got are different. And that means, and there's only one model, right? That's the argument that we've made here that fits the data perfectly. So when the train error goes to zero, we're actually getting hugely different models depending on which particular data set we drew. Um, However, when the number of parameters are much bigger than the size of the data, um, there are many perfect models. Now, if you were being Bayesian and you were integrating over all of these models, all of these models would just add variance. Right? Your intuition about this, the, the weirdness of this curve would be truly that this curve is weird. The variance should just keep on increasing, right? But we are not um, you know, like looking at all the possible of those perfect models. We're actually looking at only a very few of them, right? A very specific set of them, because we're doing gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, um, with initializing weights small. So what this means is that of all the many reasonable models that are out there, by reasonable models, um, the ones that are fitting the data well, we are going to be choosing the ones where we don't have to move so far, right? Because we start with a weight small. We know we can find a perfect fit nearby. There's so many models with perfect fits, right? Because we have so many parameters. So we actually don't move very far. And we end up with a model with small parameters. So imagine if you were putting like an L2 regularization to keep the models small. Um, SGD starting with small weights is also a form of regular implicit regularization to keep the models small, right? So we're choosing, there, there's something very specific and special going on here where we're choosing small models. Models, sorry, models with smaller weights um, that tend that turn out to have better regularization properties, um, and that's why when you increase the parameters again, um, 
it's kind of like allowing yourself to do this regularization. Because when you are here, right, in this critical phase, you know, regularization, if you're just put, if you're just doing your gradient descent, there is no implicit regularization. There's one model that fits and it fits the noise. Um, but as you do this, there are multiple models and you can find one that's maybe um, smoother in some, some way because you pick one that has smaller weights. Now, a, a bonus um, thing to, to think about here it, uh, in terms of weird counterintuitive things that can happen is that this picture actually suggests that adding more data can sometimes make your uh, variance worse. Because let's say you're in a regime where um, your, your number of parameters is, uh, is less than the, than the size of the data set, uh, sorry, is more than the size of the data, right? So you're kind of in this regime over here. Um, and now you increase the size of the data set. Well, increasing the size of the data set is gonna push this bump further out, right? Because this bump happens around where um, the number of parameters is equal to the number of data or the complexity of the model is similar to the complexity of the data. Um, and so weirdly, adding more data can actually make your test error worse, right? And again, this is something that um, Boaz's lab has shown in, in, you know, in some of their, their papers and stuff like this. So, you know, this, you know, understanding neural networks is definitely, you know, a, a hot research area. It's an area in progress. Um, but I think it's really exciting that we are getting these insights into how these models work. Um, which gives us, again, a better sense of like how to use them, how to create them, how to deploy them. Great. So we'll stop there and I will hang out um, if there are any lingering questions.